question. All right, let's go ahead and get started. And while the remaining people might come in, I will uh, do some introductions. And it's great pleasure, and I'm really kind of excited to introduce uh, Professor Gerhard Fischer. Uh, the most famous claim to fame was he was my advisor. In 1992, I got my PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder with Gerhard. But uh, Gerhard's been very busy over his career. Uh, most notably at the University of Colorado, he created the Center for Lifelong <coughs> Learning and Design. So it brings together, as you can tell from the name, a lot of different themes, uh, but notably that we are always learning. We're always lifelong learners. And uh, we're always problem solving and designers. Uh, Gerhard is a member of the Chi Academy, for those of you who know that. And he's also a fellow of the ACM. And uh, has many, many publications on design, learning, is active in the computer-supported collaborative learning community. And maybe without further ado, um, I will introduce Gerhard Fischer. Well, thank you, David. So, uh, this is the title of my talk, and uh, what I want to do is your mic on? Oh, no, it's not on. Thanks. How about now? Yep. Is it about the right loudness, or shall I turn it down? Yeah. Good. OK, so what I want to talk about is first sort of to convey a basic message, a take-home message. But then I want to uh, tell you uh, briefly in which sense I consider this a homecoming <laughs> to UC Irvine. Uh, talk a little bit about the present where we talk about, uh, have thought a lot about human-centered design, and then finish or the later part with this notion, why am I interested in quality of life and why do I consider it something relevant? So the basic message is that as we look as computer scientists at the question progress in science and technology, we have often thought about things that we cannot do them. And then we made progress in science and technology and we can do them now. And I illustrated this with a number of themes. And the purple ones we sort of have worked on ourselves and the blue ones are sort of maybe themes which are discussed but not quite realities. And so I will mention some of, of the purple ones later on in my presentation. Now, for me the interesting question is, we cannot do it, now we can do it. And then the question comes up, should it be done? And how do we make sort of decision about this? Uh, and there is where quality of life comes in, ethics, values, impact choice, control, autonomy. And are these themes which, as we shape a curriculum for an informatics department, we should worry about these issues or say, they are maybe at some level as important as uh, the technology aspect. And another interest derived from this is about design trade-offs, because I believe, particularly in these purple themes here, there are no best solutions, but there are lots of trade-offs. So what I want to do is sort of to end up with this, discussing these notions of quality of life, arguing that we have to deal with design trade-offs. To use, I know in part my connection to UCI is to many people here working also in the Kai community, and I always found this kind of vision for time frames in human-computer interaction it was published a long time ago in 1985, uh, be a good framing element. And around 1985, I would say most of the research was still done 
sort of in the low two areas, neural and biochemical, uh, psych uh, psychological. And my interest, our interest with the people with, um, who have worked, and I know m many interests of the people here, is more at the upper end. So, so asking questions about how technology develop culture, system development, design, and education, which, as David said, is sort of the defining names from our uh, center. So in which sense do I choose the known homecoming to UC Irvine? Well, uh, I was a PhD student here for one year. I didn't finish my PhD. Uh, in a year which I said yesterday to some people in a class where many of you were maybe not even born then. It was 1972 to 1973. And why I mention some of these names is because, and why it is relevant potentially for the topic of my talk, because seeds were planted sort of in my sphere of interest and activities by some of these people. And I have chosen three, not because there were not more people around. So John Seely Brown, who gave a talk in this series earlier this fall semester, uh, with him, we worked on our co-taught. He was a formal instructor, but a couple of people helped him to ask what would it mean that social science students should be computationally or digitally literate? And we used logo, if that tells you something, as a user-friendly version of Lisp to allow to deal with non-numerical uh, data structures. And that led me into the logo community where I later did my PhD uh, in around this topic. Uh, and after my PhD, I had a postdoc at MIT in Xerox Park, which in the late 70s, again, if some of you know that, was the place to be when you wanted to see modern technology working. The second person was Peter Freeman. He uh, sort of got me interested in design. Uh, we, I took a class with him in the textbook or the book we read was Sciences of the Artificial. Through that I got to know Herbert Simon, who later, if you know what a German degree of a habilitation is, sort of a second PhD vaguely. Uh, and uh, so Herbert Simon became the advisor for my habilitation, where I talked in the early 80s about human-computer interaction theories and systems. And then Peter also, I don't know whether people had grants from the Science of Design program at NSF. He was the director, initiated this program, and we got a grant, so some of our research activities uh, we are also influenced by this. And the third one is uh, Bill Howden, who sits over here, if people don't know him. Uh, he was, I took classes from him in software engineering, and he has stayed with this theme, particularly in software testing. But he also taught me, <laughs> or took me on sailing mm -hmm. trips, took me on diving for abalone and how to play tennis. So uh, my social life was enriched also while I was here uh, at, CU, uh, at UCI. Then, I mean, in today's uh, environment, uh, Judy and Gary Olson, who were at Michigan before, and uh, we created together the Human Computer Interaction Consortium, uh, HCIC, uh, we created together, and I still remember, uh, there was a meeting at the house in Ann Arbor, the Design of Interactive Systems Conference. Uh, Gloria and Alfred I had known from a long time ago uh, back in Germany, where all of us were in Germany. David and Andre came from CU to UCI, so 
uh, there was some people from uh, Colorado here. And what I also find interesting that one of my previous visits, Dick Taylor showed me huge documents that he wanted to create a design school at UCI many, many years back. And uh, he felt it was close. And I think maybe Irvine missed an opportunity because schools of design have now become a very popular entity. Uh, Stanford has one. San Diego uh, has one. Uh, in Germany, there is one uh, also uh, 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 supported by one of the founders of SAP. Two more issues, uh, UCI people also came to see you. Uh, Ken Anderson and Lesha Palin now have become uh, essential elements of our activities at, U uh, at CU. And I also was involved in a review of the, I guess it was actually for the whole school, not only the informatics department, but I was one of the people that he, uh, or focused on the informatics department. So this was my, why I feel this is a homecoming event, but it's not only to be physically here, but that there were many substantial interaction and so those interaction influenced some of the stuff what I will talk about today. So the present is human-centered design. And maybe a little bit in analogy to this table which I showed you. I mean, the first big concern of human, com uh, human computer interaction was to create usable system. And this led to user-centered design. There was a famous book uh, edited by Norman and Traber. And one of our first research efforts which we pursued in Colorado was to say, well, usable systems which are not useful are not a big gain. And at the surface, one can argue that usable and useful, that there is a versus relationship. System with lots of functionality, like high functionality environment, which we studied for quite some time, are useful, but they suffer maybe from being usable. And so a uh, longer term research effort was how to turn this versus relationship into an end relationship, create systems which are usable and useful. I think later on, as this was more captured, then concepts like engaging entered the HCI community. And how can you build systems which have a low threshold and a high ceiling? How can you support learning and demand? How can you support uh, the concept of flow, which is a concept derived from the work of Six and Mihaly. And the most recent uh, issue, which thinking about, well, where could HCI research in the future go, sort of from my personal point of view, is that it should, should touch upon quality of life and design trade-offs. And I will return to this later on. What I also learned that design is a concept understood very differently. So there was this science of design program, and there was a meeting in Washington where they brought 60 to 80 PIs all having an NSF project together. And in the middle of the meeting, you know, the, uh, the program is called Science of Design. <coughs> And in the middle of the meeting, a huge conversation starts. Well, what is actually design? And here are sort of two, I would say, of the many uh, notions how people understand design. And if we would have more time, we could do an experiment that each one of you would write down on a note how you understand design. And I would say we would probably end up with a variety of different explanations there. So 
let me call them traditional software engineering people, understood design as one step in a waterfall type model in software engineering. My understanding of design is grounded in Simon's book, The Sciences of the Artificial, where he argues that there are the natural science which studies how things are, and since there is design which studies how things ought to be. And if you choose this the, uh, definition of design, then being a good cook is a design activity. Uh, knitting a pair of socks is a design activity. And uh, this is a very different, much broader understanding of design uh, since the first one. But this is the one which we operated with and chose for the name of our center. So I already d discussed design trade-offs, and one very early on what we articulating was that at one end, called the Turing Talpit in design activity, it said, beware of the Turing Talpit in which everything is possible but nothing of interest is easy. So I mean, if you ever took a class in theoretical computer science, they will tell you that a Turing machine can compute everything, or if you had add one and sub one recursively, you could reinvent all of computation. And we tried to differentiate it between objective com uh, computability, which the theorists wanted to explore versus subjective com uh, computability, which one could do in a world of realities and practice. So I mean, in an objective measurement, I could have walked from Boulder to Irvine. So nothing would uh, you know, the theoretically prevent me from this, but for a subjective objective, this would have probably not a good idea unless I started somewhere back in July or so. <laughs> the inverse of the, but we also to say, you know, this is one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum we labeled as the inverse of the Turing tarpet, arguing that we should be aware of over specialized systems where operations are easy but little of interest is possible. In analyzing this design trade-offs, we worked on domain-oriented design environment. And this led us for some time, so this is a, a, a research effort which was sort of initiated in the late 80s, but it carried off into many directions and we actually got quite a bit of credit for this where we created a domain-oriented design environment for kitchen designers. And the basic idea was this is not a general computational environment, but it is an environment where kitchen designers, not being interested in computers per se, could carry out design tasks. We uh, analyzed, for example, design by composition as one design methodology, having parts which we throw in the work area, differentiated this from design by modification. We had a catalog where uh, existing kitchen designs were stored, which we could bring in here and modify it. And if someone created a new system, it got sort of inserted in this. And we also explored critiquing system. You may not be able to read this, but this is a design which someone carries out that the length of the work triangle is greater than 23 feet. And that was a critique which the users could accept, explore further, and so on. And David actually, with his students, pursued the notion of critiquing quite a bit further uh, but one of the earlier critiquing systems was developed here. So I already mentioned the, what, what I felt this research contributed, and I think it's still valid today. We wanted to transcend construction kits, which additional supports is led to critiquing system. 
Another big finding at the time was that computer science may suffer or the development of software system from the thin spread of application knowledge. And we argued that maybe in the longer term, one want to advance human computer interaction to human problem domain interaction. So the problem domain in this case was the domain of kitchen design. And you reposition yourself between the Turing tar pit and the inverse of the Turing tar pit. Then a question which occupied us for a long time and led to one of the PhD theses was uh, end user modifiability, end user development. So let's say a kitchen designer is confronted with this uh, set of parts. Now, he also wanted to introduce a microwave into the kitchen, but the microwave didn't exist yet in this part. Now, obviously, we as the designer of the systems could develop this, but the challenge was can we create environments in which a kitchen designer could create this? And this led to this interest in end user development. And we subsequently developed over a long time uh, the concept of meta design, standing for designer for de uh, design for designers and cultures of participation, which are still very active elements in our thinking today. Now, to make the shift of moving from the kitchen design the system. We conceptualized this, that this was focused on the individual designer. And we now, what I will describe next, is a system called Envisionment and Discovery Collaboratory, which should empower design communities rather than just individual designers. So this is a screen image or an image of the uh, envisionment and discovery collaboratory. We very early on, uh, one of the member of our research team was a very talented uh, technologist and hardware designer. So very early on, we developed tabletop computing environments. Uh, so this table, which you see here, is actually a computer. We analyze tangible interaction methods with this environment. If Donald Schoen is, you, uh, uh, is a person known to you, his basic uh, problem solving strategy was reflection in action. So this was the action <coughs> space in which people developed solutions and if something occurred and you wanted to have more information, you had a reflection space, which was this one. And there was a linkage to make information relevant to the task at hand. And maybe an early quality of life aspect in this setting was that the people who gathered around this setting, and we worked a lot in urban development issues because one of my colleagues was an architect and urban developer, was to decentralize the decision-making process. So citizens felt not that there were some people in a city administration or government institution who decided what's good for them, but they could develop scenarios with different stakeholders, with different input to analyze what was best for them. Here is a screenshot that we also used it for, again, bringing in human problem domain interactions. This was a meeting of the Boulder City Council with the University of Colorado Regents, which brought this community together to use our environment for somewhat realistic planning tasks uh, occupying the controversies between the city and the university. And we studied a lot of HCI techniques, like you could draw new bus lines into this by using a pen, which one of these people does in this uh, image. Another issue 
if you ever have been to Boulder, it's situated in front of the Rocky Mountains. And one of the most controversial issues in urban planning tasks are height limitations. So none of the people like if there are new buildings going up which would block their views of the mountains. And to visualize this in your head, what a particular building would do to your personal view that you have a house somewhere, is quite complicated. And so we use geographical information system, Google Earth, that very quickly we could sort of design views where we would understand what the impact of these buildings would be. And again, in some ways affecting the quality of life of people living in the city, putting the discussion on a more rational grounds than just having opposing opinions. And the last image which I want to show you of the system is uh, a little bit related to if people collaborate, are the collaborative outcomes transcend what is in the individual human mind? So this was the design bus routes. And uh, the question was, where should the bus stops go? And so the, city, uh, the system uh, supported that you could say, oh, this is my house. You could mark the location of your house on this geographical information system maps. And then you were asked, how long would you like to walk in good weather and in bad weather? And the system for each individual contributor drew these concentric circles, the closest circle for bad weather, the larger circle for good weather. And then after several people participated, you saw images of this kind to come up. And one of the arguments which we were debating was, does such an image exist in any individual mind, or does this collaborative effort create images which is just an outcome of the collaborative activity? And again, maybe provide better decision making, or people are more willing to accept solutions if they could contribute in this way. Uh, along these lines, we explore different design methodologies. And what I briefly want to mention, because I said meta design became quite uh, important uh, to us, to differentiation to participatory design. And Judith and I, I don't know whether some uh, people here in the audience, we were sort of attending participatory design conferences for a long time. Now, what's the difference, and I think there is a fundamental difference between participatory design and meta design. In participatory design, or in all design processes, you have a notion of design time and use time. And in participatory design, you draw from all the users some representative and make them a member of the design team. And if the Scandinavians contributed something to computer human interaction research, I think participatory design was one of their major contribution. What we were interested with meta designer was that, and we collected empirical data for this, we read, ar read articles about this, that design in most realistic design tasks never stops. But at use time, sure, it's use time to some extent, but it is also this remains design time. And so what the new thing is, that is the user as designer, and there are a few of those, and maybe I should have colored them a little bit more distinctively, where they could at use time not only absorb what was there, but could make their own contribution, which brings back sort of the notion of end user development. And here I used a few concepts to say, well, why is that interesting? So here we deal with a world as imagined, and here 
we deal with a world as experience. <coughs> here we deal with prediction, and here we can deal with reality. Here we plan, and here we have situated action. And if you know, for example, Lucy Suchman's work, which was sort of a fundamental insight into expert system research, that planning has its limitation and should be complemented by situated action. And again, the question is, you know, why would someone would like to act as a designer uh, uh, and what motivates people to be so? I basically said all of this already. So derived from meta design, we uh, studied or created this concept of cultures of participation, saying there are cultures which are primarily consumer cultures, which produces finished, uh, finished goods to be consumed passively, to cultures of participation where we provide all people with the means to participate actively in personally meaningful problems. And subsequently, we studied a lot of systems which developed at the time. I mean, Wikipedia is probably the most famous one, where the designers of Wikipedia, in our terminology, are the meta-designers, but Everyone, if you choose to do so, you can be an active contributor to uh, uh, Wikipedia. We did some research more, I mean, we observed research surrounding Wikipedia. Uh, we didn't really do research there. Uh, there was, Google has an outfit in Boulder uh, built on SketchUp, which is a uh, system to develop 3D models. And there is a huge 3D warehouse which con uh, contains uh, 100,000 millions of different models. So we worked with them on what motivates people to create these uh, 3D models. We also conceptualized open source communities from this perspective. And a couple of my PhD students did a research, uh, did a PhD on open source communities, what exploring concepts like intrinsic motivation, social capital, and we developed a richer ecology of participation. So if we talk about participation, it's not only you participate or you don't participate, but there are levels of participation. And this was the result of a PhD thesis to identify these different layers of participation from passive users all the way to project leaders. And uh, we identify these roles. Usually the demands for the roles grow larger as you move towards the middle. And again, the question is what motivates people to engage in these communities? <coughs> Let me skip this. So, to return to this notion of binary choice, I wrote an article, uh, I guess it was entitled, Beyond Couch Potatoes from Consumers to Active Contributors, where I was all enthusiastic, okay, now we have found out that this is a real thing, until I analyzed sort of my own behavior and found out, well, sometimes I actually like to be a consumer. And so this, created this as a binary choice, namely that in uh, sort of choices which we have to make, that sometimes we want to be a designer, but we are forced to be a consumer. We are not giving the tools to change something, and we argued that this would be in personally meaningful activities. But then there is someone who wants to be a consumer, but is forced to be a designer, active consumer, where we are perfectly fine with our consumer role, and we argue that this would be the case in <coughs> personally irrelevant activities. So based on this, I wanted to show that this notion of 
what does quality of life mean, what does intrinsic motivation mean, what does social capital mean, uh, that we now, I now would like in the last part to briefly say, well, why could quality of life be an interesting concept for communities like the HCI community? Now, first of all, it has this wide range of contexts. And these are just some of the things uh, where we can speak about quality of life. And Walt showed me a system earlier today where he thinks about quality of life for people who <coughs> suffered from a stroke. Uh, we wanted specifically to say what does it mean for us as HCI researchers or researchers in software design or in CSCW. <coughs> so I started off this with a very informal questionnaire which I gave <coughs> to courses which I taught or to people. And I said, you know, from your personal point of view, did some of these systems improve your quality of life or did, uh, did it uh, rather have negative impacts on your quality of life? And uh, I mean, you found people in all of these things basically on both sides. And uh, so the notion of what are the design trade-offs behind this thing. So an interesting, because Facebook is on there, I have been a very early, signed up for Facebook very early. So I have an, a Facebook account, but I never really use it. So yesterday I gave a talk in David's class, and David sent a Facebook message around. And since yesterday, I got 15 messages commenting on this. So uh, I didn't study them all carefully. I could probably have spent two hours to analyze them, what people have to say and to respond to it. So I mean, the question is, you know, to which extent do we feel that yeah, we remain involved in a community, we are aware of what's going on, or to which extent do we say, well, we have better things to do, which I assume many of you are faced with a similar question. So to return to this notion of trade-offs, design is choice. It's an argumentative process with no optimal solution. Therefore, it requires uh, trade-offs. These questions have no correct solutions or right answers. And this is a list of things which we can cast in this framework. So we were particularly interested in contrasting informate from automate. Informate meaning empowering humans, automate meaning replacing humans, which I think is somewhat the intellectual uh, distinction between HCI and artificial intelligence or we played around with this acronym, one being IA versus the other one being AI. And even we had a project from NSF about uh, energy sustainability. And at one level, you can say that there were energy control, advi control devices which people need to know, know to operate, wherein a lot of research was or going on in energy automation, or the current discussion about self-driving cars versus uh, advanced driver uh, assistance systems can be cast in this as well. So let me pick out the one which I said here, less information in choice versus more information in choice. So the question here is more, more. Uh, more slides in presentation, more Facebook friends and Twitter followers, more publications to achieve a higher age index, more new versions from Adobe and Microsoft, more apps on smartphones, uh, and so on. And what I find actually really annoying to say, you know, I have my own personal views on these issues, 
if you do something today, whatever it is to make a reservation, staying a hotel, having a repair service, within minutes sometimes, within hours, you get a message. Well, please comment on your experience. And I always felt, you know, I could spend a substantial amount of my life if I would take these messages serious. So here is an interesting <laughs> question. Uh, if you consider what kind of tombstone you may choose, whether this is a model for, you know, who you say, who you wear in your life, and uh, the competition, you know, can go on, that this poor guy only had 672 Twitter followers, and you can say, well, I definitely want to support, uh, surpass this guy. Uh, so the alternative question is less more, and I often told students when I said, you, you know, give me a little write-up back, that uh, at this quote from Pascal, I have made this letter longer than usual because I lack the time to make it shorter, which I think is an interesting challenge, and sometimes time constraints are really important to achieve that. Or oh, Herb Simon's quote, what information consumes, it rather, uh, it's rather obvious, it consumes the attention of in a recipient, hence a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And in today's world where the smartphones information is constantly around us, I think this is an interesting challenge. There could be more topics, uh, I mean one of it is in many areas personalization is seen as, you know, this is something very desirable, and it is, uh, because it helps us potentially to reduce uh, information overflow. The negative is, well, it may be a real severe, has a severe impact on our <coughs> privacy issues, and a uh, few months ago there was a story going around in the popular press that Target knows when its shoppers are pregnant based on personalization and data analysis and so on. I think a nice thing is, again relating maybe more back to our research issue, to which extent do we suffer from groupthink? If everything is personalized and these information delivery techniques are tailored to our individual <coughs> needs, uh, maybe we are getting closed in into a particular world and never see things outside of it. So I watched this video some time ago, uh, it's a TED talk about filter bubbles, and if that tension is of interest to you, I recommend that maybe you spend 20 minutes to watch this filter bubble, uh, to watch this uh, video about filter bubbles. So there are many more design trade-offs, issues which may impact quality of life. But let me finish by saying, to return a little bit to the design theme, and say the future which we envision is not out there to be discovered, but it has to be invented and designed. And we, if we accept this in sort of the notion of Simon's sciences of the artificial, the next question is invented and designed by whom? By them, whoever them is, by you, by us. And, you know, if you kind of read the newspapers today and you find that some people believe that climate change is a hoax, that uh, intelligent design is really a, a competitive theory to uh, evolution, then you see that there are powers there who have ideas what the future should be, what the future, how the future should be designed. And for me, the question is, you know, what sort of can we do? And what I try to convey in this talk, that what I find personally interesting is to use this quality of life perspective and inherent in this discussion 
is to explore design trade-offs. Thank you. We have time for questions to three. Yeah, you had that uh, one slide where there was a sort of a table, which I believe was kind of a vocabulary or context for design activities. And then there was another one. Uh, yeah, I'm not, what was on that other, the one I, the, the guy's pointing at? Yeah. So as I, uh, as I try to say, the overall problem approach was uh, derived, inspired by Donald Schoen, who talked about reflection in action. So he argues that people act to design, in this case, a certain environment, like I said, we studied urban design activities. But then a breakdown occurs. There is some information which is people are not aware, and then in the second, the vertical uh, display was, we call this the action space and this the reflection space. And so the system was able to contextualize information relevant to the particular design situation explored here by providing additional information in the reflection space. So there were huge, uh, I mean, we worked together with uh, UCAR and NCAR in Boulder, where there were huge uh, information, they had created huge information spaces which we uh, integrated uh, with our system. So to give you a very simple example, so people debate where should the bus stop go, and there was uh, information about the bus stop being too long or too short, which again is a design trade-off situation. And people then should be aware what is known about distances of bus stops in bus lines of a certain environment, a certain neighborhood. And this information would have been in the reflection space. Well, because this were environments which, I mean, uh, we, where we also studied this notion of meta design. Uh, let me give one more, uh, one or spend one more sentence on this. One of the original design objectives was to create an environment to turn SimCity in an end user modifiable environment. So we analyzed SimCity. I assume some of you know it, it's a game. And if in some cities there is too much crime, what the user can do is to increase the number of police stations. What the user could not do to say, well, I don't want to fight crimes, I want to sort of prevent crimes, so rather spending more resources on fighting crimes, I want to in uh, increase social services. So you wanted to introduce in this environment a new element leading to the need for end user development. And so this whole environment, one perspective of it, was to see it as an end user modifiable environment for uh, Sin City. Yeah, thanks. That was, that was extremely interesting, and I love the um, I love the emphasis on the quality of life. So, um, there's a couple of questions. Um, one, it, it, sort of about the role of the designer. I don't know if I can make this coherent, but um, the you know if you take socio-technical systems work, you know the, there's a line in there that design necessarily accompanies use. Um, that there's always workarounds. There's always design process going on. Um, so. Now, what is the specific role of the designer in making that meta design work? Um, the second question, which I think is related, is about the quality of life. I mean, I can't, if I'm asked a questionnaire 
about whether cell phones are going to change my life. I don't know. Um, and I can't imagine life without cell phones now, I mean, because they've become un unavoidable for me. Um, but a before and after, uh, <coughs> it's a very, very difficult question about working out when do I make the design decision that there is a trade-off going on here. Yeah, I think, you know, we build we built some systems, we analyzed the existing system. So, I mean, let's go to Wikipedia. The meta designers who design for design are the people who built Wikipedia, but in this case created end user modifiability possibilities that you click on the edit button and you can insert things. Everyone can do that. And uh, that, I think, is you know, to say we should get rid of this assumption that systems are designed and then they are sort of delivered to the world, but it's more interesting to say how can, as a, as a systems model our world, and our world changes, how can we change the systems that there is not too big a discrepancy? So did this answer the first part of your question? Um, the second part was, uh, remind me. Well, it's, it's, it's quality of life issues. I mean, you know, ah, I, yeah. it, it's really hard just to ask, ask someone yeah. so, what, so is let, the, what is the trade-off. Yeah. We don't know what the trade-offs are. Sure. So let me sort of choose myself as an example. So I resisted for a long time to have a smartphone. Yeah. And the resistance was that I felt our lives are dominated by urgent activities and important activities. And I feel, I don't know how many of you would sympathize with that feeling or idea, is that already with dealing with my email, it pushed me more and more to the urgent thing. And I had less time, at least that is how I felt, for important things. And owning a smartphone even pushes this f us further to the urgent end. So people come to a talk, and I mean, to listen to a talk is, you know, too long. I mean, why would you listen 45 minutes? You have to inspect your smartphone <laughs> in between, right? This is, a, a speaker should not be offended because this is standard practice. Or you teach a class and, you know, you see that your students below uh, or maybe openly inspect their smartphones. So, I mean, in some ways, these are design trade-offs, and different people can come down on different ends of the spectrum. But I think at least to uncover the design trade-offs and to make people aware that we also pay a price for something, I think is, is, is important. And I mean, the other one which I introduced, and I know that Alfred works a lot on, on privacy, I mean, we have supermarkets, and uh, I assume it's not different here from Boulder, you sign up to be a member, which means basically the supermarket knows what you buy. And we get encouraged to do so because they give you special prices if you are a member. But it raises privacy issues, and where do we, cons you may now say, I could care less whether a supermarket knows what I buy or what not. But I think that there are issues where privacy and personalization are a real design trade-off. And quality of, I consider this a quality of life issue where there's no, as I said, there's no best solution, but to create an awareness of what we individually and maybe what we care about, what we want to emphasize. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I also thought your talk was very fascinating, so thank you. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask you is to share your thoughts about uh, the politics of design and the notions of things like uh, design for misdirection, design for misrepresentation, uh, design for exclusion, you know, that 
we want that uh, some institutional systems or some information systems, like the information bubbles you talk about, are intentionally designed to steer people, uh, not necessarily uh, to improve their quality of life, but to improve potentially somebody else's quality of life by misdirecting them into thinking, oh, okay, things are really better for you when in fact you're just being exploited. So do you have any thoughts or opinions about this? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the first place, yeah, we try to face these uh, assumptions. I mean, if we teach a class, we make certain assumptions what is good for our students. And uh, so, intentionally or unintentionally, we take sort of our stance through what we say and what we act upon. Now, what we consider totally ethical, legitimate, may not be looked upon in the same way by people who don't share our world views. I just learned uh, that uh, which I found interesting, that the Oxford Dictionary, which has sort of some authority to introduce new concepts to this world, introduced post-truth as a new concept. Uh, so this is now an official concept. And I mean, you know, we as scientists sort of feel, well, we are more sort of on post-fact, but this has sort of, you know, all developed just very recently new dimensions. And now, you know, is it to be post-truth? Is that fashionable? Is that ethical? Does that contribute to our life because it makes us as recipients from this post-truth feel good? So, yeah, I mean, your question, there can be misinformation. I think, again, if I understand this correctly, that Google and Facebook struggle with misinformation accusations, very recent again. Is that along your lines? Should that be avoided? Who has the authority to avoid that? Are we as empowered citizens have a right to stand up against these issues? And in some ways, I would feel, yeah, this has you know, my quality of life with respect to modern information and communication technologies influenced by such issues. I think that's a very stimulating point to take down to the uh, happy hour, because uh, we can argue that in a lot of different ways. So uh, that's one floor down for those of you who uh, don't know on the fifth floor. And uh, let's thank you.